Good morning, everyone. So today we take up the 50th gate of the 108 gates of Dharma illumination. And following our talk today, we'll do the World Peace Ceremony. So we have a, a full day today, which is why the, uh, a little bit of change of venue here. <laughs> I'm in front of my liturgical space today so we can do the, the World Peace Ceremony. So the gate today, the 50th gate says, the sense organs are a gate of Dharma illumination for with them we practice the right way. So the kanji here for the sense organs are actually a, a Buddhist expression. Um, this is not the everyday term that you know one would use for the normal five senses of sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. This is a particularly Buddhist context for this. Um, so this gate statement uses a word for entry or entrance um, to indicate sense organs. So the complete phrase is rokunyu or something like six entries, or usually we might say six sense gates. So maybe you've run across and you're reading this term six sense gates. So this is the, the sense, <laughs> no pun intended, of this you know, particular gate statement. So why six rather than five? Usually we think about uh, you know, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. Um, in Buddhism, the mind is a sense organ. So we'll talk about that in a minute, right? So we've got six sense organs when it comes to this gate. So there are other similar Buddhist terms for the sense organs. Sometimes it's six roots, sometimes it's six places or six bases. Uh, but for today, we have the gateways of eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. So these are called gates, sense gates, because stimulation comes in from the outside. And then we express our thoughts or feelings or emotions you know, back to the outside. So there's this sense of a gateway, the sense is being a gateway. So in the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha tells us that the origin of suffering is craving. This is one of the most basic teachings of our tradition. Uh, in the twelvefold chain of dependent origination, then craving arises from sensations. And sensations result from these six sense organs being in contact with objects. So the eye sees something, the skin touches something, uh, sensation arises. That sensation might be pleasant, it might be unpleasant, it might be neutral. So we have various kinds of sensations that come up. When we think of the mind as a sense organ, then the objects of mind, as opposed to the objects of eye or ear or anything else, objects of minds are memories or images or things we think about, concepts, right? Think, things we think about with the mind. So we have all of that, and then we start writing a story, and we start running after things, chasing after things, running away from things, avoiding some other things. Um, and then we've got the whole story about how suffering arises. So these 18 elements, which is the sense organs and the things that they're in contact with, and then the sensations that arise, are the foundations for the three poisons of greed, anger, and ignorance. This is where that whole thing begins, <laughs> right? We're in contact with something, we have some response to that. Right away, there's this unfolding of a chain. Um, so we have greed, anger, and ignorance. So again, sense organ comes in contact with an object, Sensation arises, three poisons arise, craving starts, we have suffering, we're writing a story. So that's how that whole thing unfolds. So Buddha said to overcome craving and to overcome suffering, the, the suffering that results from that craving, we need some wisdom. We need to develop some insight into how the senses work and how this chain unfolds and how this whole thing gets started and plays out. And then we can exercise some care in how we use our senses or how we work with our senses and the things that arise from our senses. So in the first talk that he gave after he woke up, the Buddha said, one who has gone forth from worldly life should not indulge in two extremes. What are these two? There is indulgent in desi indulgence in desirable sense objects, which is low, vulgar, worldly, ignoble, unworthy, and unprofitable. And there is devotion to self-mortification, which is painful, unworthy, and unprofitable. Avoiding both of these extremes, the Tathagata has realized the middle path. It produces vision, it produces knowledge, it leads to calm, to higher knowledge, to enlightenment, to nirvana. So this gate is taking us back to the most basic, <laughs> the most, one of the most important teachings in our tradition. You know, for example, don't indulge greed by grabbing all the chocolate cake and all the gourmet pink lettuce right? Uh, but also don't ignore the needs of the body. Don't, you know, sort of mortify the body by not eating or not eating properly or something like that. The middle way is 
take care of the body with reasonable, nutritious, appealing food without being caught up in the senses and going to extremes, right? So this is not about um, mortifying the body, cutting off the senses in order to somehow do some really extreme ascetic practice, but neither is it about indulging every whim that comes along. And of course, we saw this in the Buddha's life, right? He was raised in a sort of luxurious condition. He decided that wasn't the answer. You know, he left that. He did some kind of extreme ascetic practices, decided that wasn't it either, and came to this middle way, right? So when we're dealing with the senses, it's really about paying attention to where are, you know, where are we there? Are we, are we falling to one side or the other, uh, or are we paying attention to the middle way? So in fact, sensory desire is considered one of the five hindrances, right? Uh, looking for happiness, looking for comfort through gratifying the senses and clinging to the thoughts and the ideas and the impulses that are related to that. Uh, you know, when we're doing that, it's really hard to focus. It's hard to settle down in our practice or in our life, if we're always being pulled around by senses, what's coming in through the sense gate and getting caught up in that. So we don't have to ignore or suppress what our senses are doing. It's a, you know, what our senses are doing is part of this human condition. If they're functioning normally, you know, information is coming in, right? There are things that, that we're being aware of through our senses, um, you know, but we do need to pay attention to how is that going? <laughs> how are we involved with that? How are we interacting with that? What stories are we writing about that? Um, you know, typically what's happening is we're creating some suffering around that. Um, you know, and we also know somehow the enjoyment that we get from gratifying the senses is not ultimately going to lead to some permanent kind of happiness or permanent kind of contentment. Uh, because when whatever those sensations are go away, now we have suffering. Now we've you know, set ourselves up for some kind of suffering. So I really love the chocolate cake, love to eat the chocolate cake, but there's only so much chocolate cake. And at some point that sensation goes away. And then what? You know, then I look for the next thing or I run away from, you know, the next thing I'm trying to avoid. So there are several important themes about the sense gate that show up kind of throughout our tradition. One is that the world we create using the data that comes in through the sense gates is an illusion. Um, another is that the sense gates and everything that go with them both exist and don't exist. And these are teachings about emptiness. And a third is that although the sense gates lead us to these three poisons and really are the basis of the suffering that we create, they are also instances of prajna or instances of wisdom. So first let's talk about this sort of illusory world of the senses. Uh, we'd like to think that when our senses come in contact with something, we get a complete, true, pure picture of whatever that something is, right? We'd like to think I see something and I know everything about it. Uh, because this is a, I'm getting a complete picture of whatever it is. Um, especially if it's a neutral object and we don't have any strong feelings about it one way or another, we don't particularly love it or particularly hate it. We think, well, you know, I'm in a good position to see this thing clearly or experience this thing clearly. Uh, we think we've, we have really perceived the reality of whatever that thing is. Not possible actually, for a couple of reasons. One is the human body is limited, right? <clears throat> we can't see all sides of an object at the same time. If I'm holding this up, I'm seeing one side, but you're seeing another, right? I can't possibly see the entirety of this object uh, because my human eye is limited. My human body is limited. We can't see some colors of light on the spectrum. We can't hear some frequencies of sound. Um, you know, Hojasan makes the point that humans can't hear everything that dogs can hear. So what we might consider to be a quiet circumstance might be very noisy for dogs. <laughs> Right? We can't perceive everything through the senses that makes up the, this entire moment and this one unified reality. So another problem is that we immediately filter whatever comes in through the sense gates through our previous knowledge, our previous experiences, because we want to categorize it. Is this thing good for me? Is it bad for me? Is it like something else I've experienced? How do I make sense of this thing? You know, this is just an automatic function. Something comes in we interact with it. We want to categorize it, label it, make sense of it. Uh, you know, that seems to be chocolate cake. I know I like chocolate cake. You know, I want that thing. Or that looks like a bat. I had a bad experience with a bat in my house once. And eh, right. So immediately we're drawing conclusions. Immediately we're categorizing and, and sort of filtering that sense data through something. So our perception of something 
is really our own perception. It's not like anybody else's perception. It's not like our perception would have been five years ago or will be five minutes from now. There's just nothing we can grab there and say, you know, my perception is, is the totality of this thing. Can't happen. So Uchiyama Roshi says, we assume that we are all living together in one commonly shared world. However, this is not true from the perspective of the reality of our life experience, which we learn about through letting go of our thought in Zazen. For example, when you and I look at a cup, we usually assume that we are looking at the very same cup, but this isn't so in terms of true raw life experience. I am looking from my angle and with the power of my vision, and you are looking from your angle and with the power of your vision. There is absolutely no way we can exchange nor understand each other's experience. This is not only true for seeing, it is true of every perception and sense experience, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. The world in which we actually live and experience life in its vivid freshness is a world that is mine alone and yours alone. So it's kind of interesting to consider that each of us is creating our own world moment by moment by moment out of the things that are coming in through our sense gates. So my experience and your experience can never be exactly the same. Even though we see the same event or we handle the same object, uh, somehow my experience is always going to be different from yours. I've created a world which is different than yours. So my experience and the true reality of all beings can never be exactly the same either for the same reasons, right? So, you know, I have a limited perception. I have certain filters. Whatever I'm perceiving through my sense gates cannot be the totality of this one unified reality. So we have to use our senses to navigate the world, to do our bodhisattva work, you know, just to, to live and to do our daily activity. But we also have to see the illusion. We also have to see that we can be fooled and that we can make mistakes and that our picture is not the entire picture. So we have to hold both of these things as true. Yes, I need my senses. Uh, I need to rely on them and depend on them. And also, it's not the whole story. There's, you know, I'm, I'm using them to create some illusion. So there's another issue with thinking that our perceptions are completely clear. Uh, the senses don't work separately, right? If I see something, it's not only that I'm seeing something, all of my senses are working together. So something is coming in from all of those senses all the time. So we don't see something or hear something in isolation from the rest of the body's functioning, right? So that influences how we experience those sensations. Also, all of our senses interact with each other and they all work together. So they're all contributing to this picture. One of our senses could be working better than another. You know, we see something, but it's influenced by something else coming in through a different sense gate. So all of these things are working together. We can't, we can't assume that, well, we have one, you know, clear, pure data coming in through one sense gate that's not affected by all the other ones. So Hojo-san says, usually we think we see things in the same way that a mirror reflects the image of an object. We think the object is reflected in our eyes and then our eyes see the object. Yet seeing color and hearing sounds with body and mind means that our lives and our bodies do not function in such a disjointed way. It is really true that we see things not only with our eyes and hear things not only with our ears. The whole body and mind are involved in the activities of seeing objects, hearing sounds, smelling fragrances, tasting flavors, and feeling sensations. When having a meal, for example, all of our senses are engaged. We see the food's color and shape with the eyes, smell and taste the food, and even hear the sound of our biting and chewing. When we swallow, we experience satisfaction in feeling the food move down the throat until it settles in the stomach. We may think of how delicious the food is and experience gratitude for those who prepared the meal, and we may think appreciatively of the, innumerable, the immeasurable work that was done in growing, harvesting, and transporting the food. These experiences of the meal are not simply discrete products of individual sense organs and their separate objects. We experience a meal engaging the entire body and mind, right? So we see how we create this complete experience out of what comes in through the discrete various sense gates. So we've got all of these sensations coming in through the sense gates all the time. So we don't usually stop to sort out what's going on. My eye is seeing this, my ear is hearing this, I'm smelling something, right? We don't, we don't differentiate in that moment. We just experience with the whole body and mind all together and plunge into this moment, the reality, the complete reality of this moment. So it's no wonder it's so easy to cling to a sense of fixed self and to assume we have some separate independent identity, right? When our senses are helping us to create this world, you know, it's, it's, we see how we create and perpetuate this idea of self and that we cling to this idea, right? So, you know, when we look in the mirror, 
we all we, you know we see our unique faces we see the sense organs that we have of course all that exists nobody would argue about that we encounter that every day we use it every day then along comes the heart sutra which we'll be chanting in a little while for our world peace ceremony heart sutra says there is no eye ear nose tongue body mind right um, it appears to negate all of those things also that there are no objects of all of these sense organs no sight sound smell taste touch object of mind of course it goes on to say there's also no sense consciousnesses that rise from the interaction of the sense the sense gate and the sense object so you know here we have all of these things we've just said a minute ago these 18 elements are the basis of greed anger and ignorance the basis of the three poisons the basis of all our craving and all our suffering and we certainly feel that our craving and suffering is real and that our senses are real and what happens there is real and here comes the heart sutra saying no wait a minute <laughs> none of that exists so what's actually going on um, of course the teaching here is that these things have no independent permanent existence in other words they are empty they're uh, instances of emptiness so we can identify physical sense organs our sensations that arise from those sense organs are real the objects we experience are real but they don't form the entirety of reality they're partial they're influenced they're distorted they change all the time uh, you know not only that but who is it that thinks that he or she owns these sense gates <laughs> who is it that's taking in you know the the data from the sense gates uh, the impressions that come from that and turning something you know, turning that into something right who is that our teachings say there is no fixed and permanent self even the self is empty so we can really see five skandhas clinging to five skandhas and how unreliable that is we have a collection of aggregates clinging to a collection of aggregates taking in information from sense data and creating something out of that and when we look at this that way we go wait a minute <laughs> it's um it's a useful illustration about how uh, impermanent and unfixed the self really is so you know there's a collection of aggregates called i that's collecting all this stuff mixing it with various thoughts and memories and writing a story about the nature of reality and they're like hmm so many ways <laughs> for that to go off the rails right so we need to develop some wisdom to see what's really going on and to discern how to be skillful in various circumstances uh, you know in the midst of these conditions of what's coming in through the sense gates and what's we're doing what we're doing in that so Hojo-san has this to say our picture of the world is our reality but we should understand that it's distorted this is the meaning of emptiness our mind is emptiness our sense organs are emptiness things outside us are also emptiness everything is just an illusion the fact that we live with illusion is our reality when we really understand this and see how illusion is caused we can see reality through the illusion whatever we see whatever we grasp with our sense organs and consciousness is illusion when we see this we are released from attachment to our limited view to what we have to what we think we own we may not be completely free but we become less restricted by our limitations so again we're not saying that senses and sensations aren't real they just don't have an existence which is separate from anything else right and because they're connected to each other and influenced by other elements around them they can't tell us the whole story so there's nothing there we can cling to there's nothing there that we can say is forever and ever reliable right um, our perceptions are distorted and yet that's what we cling to and and make decisions based on and assume that this is the entirety of the world so Hojo-san is warning us <laughs> be careful all those things are an illusion it's fine that they're there but we need to see also you know the illusion that's happening so yes the sense organs are real and we also live with with illusion and living with that illusion is our daily reality so there are a couple of parts of a text called the Sandokai which can provide some helpful um, illustrations and you may be familiar with the Sandokai it's a poem by Shuto Shichian from 8th century China um, in English the title is the merging of difference and sameness or the merging of difference and unity this is something that in Japan we chant this poem every other day in the morning as part of our uh, morning liturgy so this is an important text for us so Sandokai is a poem about holding both individuality and distinctions right and also the larger view of non-duality so it's really um, providing some illustrations and some pictures and some help well how do we hold both of these things there are distinctions there are individual things 
and then there's something which goes beyond that. So in a couple of places it makes reference to the individual sense gates as real and functioning and yet also as not really independent and not separate from each other uh, and not separate from the objects they come in contact with and not separate from the entirety of this network, the entirety of this moment. So at one point it says each sense and every field interact and yet do not. So each sense organ makes contact with an object and sense or sensation arises from that, but also this never actually happens because the sense organ and the object were never separate to begin with, right? So if the eye is not separate from what it sees from the very beginning, you know, that the, the contact, the making contact and something arising from that can't actually happen. And yet both of these things are true. We have sense object, we have a sense organ, it makes contact with something, sensation arises, we feel that. And yet, in a larger perspective, that can't ever happen because these things were never separate to begin with. So I have ears, I can hear music, out of that some pleasant sensation arises, but also there is no separate eye uh, that's, that's uh, experiencing that. Um, you know, there's no separate eye that has something that I can distinguish as ears, which is separate from me or separate from anything else. Uh, there's nothing to be distinguished as music. There's nothing to be distinguished as a pleasant sensation. That's, there's nothing to be distinguished as separate from the entire functioning of the universe in this moment, right? So there was never any break to begin with. There was never any separation to begin with. So Hojo-san says, the sense organs of the body and mind and their objects are independent and yet work together to create the world. When we sit in this space, the space and my sitting become one. When I cook in the kitchen, this body, myself, the ingredients, the water, the fire, the utensils, and the space called the kitchen become one being working together. When we play baseball, the whole universe becomes the world of playing baseball. Our activity and the universe become one. It all works together. If we become angry, this whole world becomes the world of anger. Everything around us makes us crazy and angry. When we have a competitive mind, this entire world becomes the world of competition. Our body and mind work together with the environment to create one world. In this sense, our mind is very important. A change in our mind could change the whole world. Our practice is important because it is not just the practice of our mind, it influences the whole universe. So if I'm working in my little shop and I'm seeing and smelling the wood, and I'm feeling, you know, the chisels in my hand, I'm hearing the lathe go around, um, you know, <laughs> I'm hearing this thing cutting shavings, I'm, you know, engaged in this activity. I can identify each of those things as distinct from each other. You know, each, uh, there's some individual distinctive things happening there, but I can also see that they're not separate from the entire scene of what's going on in my shop and what's being created in the shop. So, you know, nowhere is there a separate kind of me. So of course we can apply that to any activity we're engaged with. We can see the distinctive elements because we are taking in those data through the sense gates. And also we can see through that and say, none of these things were ever separate to begin with. There is just one seamless kind of functioning. So the early Buddhists said, this is why there is no permanent essence, no Atman, no soul, right? Uh, outside of the relationship between the sense organs and their objects, you know, they were, their teaching was, our lives consist only of these 18 elements. Then the Heart Sutra comes along to say, even those things don't exist, uh, as, or they don't exist as we usually think of them. And then Dogen says, well, they exist, but they're actually empty. <laughs> so, you know, they're impermanent. There's no independent existence. So all of these things exist, but they're actually empty. And because of that, these sense gates are actually instances of prajna, or instances of wisdom. So that seems puzzling because we've just been hearing about how we can be led astray by what comes in through the sense gates, by the illusions of the sense organs and what arises from those. So how do we become able to see the senses as wisdom or the senses as prajna? And how does all that relate to our zazen practice, right? Because our zazen practice is so central to all of this. So clearly this isn't a practice of the intellect uh, because even though we know some things about physiology, there's still plenty we don't know about what the brain does with the stuff that comes in through the sense gates. Um, there's you know, plenty we don't know about how the five skandhas come to be clinging to the five skandhas and create a self out of those sense data. So Uchiyama Roshi says, who is seeing? How can we see? It is truly a mystery. 
Scientists may explain the function of retinal cells, optic nerves, and so forth, but no matter how much explanation is given, we cannot understand the most crucial point. Eyes are eyes, and things are things, but how does the consciousness of seeing arise? This is really mysterious and beyond our comprehensive thought. The root of this wondrous phenomenon can only be called life. Even if we put all the various parts of the human body together, such as head, chest, or legs, and connect them, we still cannot create a human being. Only if life functions there is there a human being. The ground such wondrous life is rooted in is Prajna Paramita. So Dogen's advice is that to hear the teaching of Buddha through everything we encounter every day, through the sense gates, uh, in other words, to perceive objects clearly, right, through Prajna, we have to free our sense gates from defilement by the three poisons. And that would seem to be a challenge because we've just said, <laughs> Here is where the three poisons start to arise. So we have to go you know, to the very earliest perceptions um, and try to work with the defilement that starts there. It's like, you know, how do we, how do we clear that? How do, we, how do we clear our view? So Hojo-san says, even though we see things, we don't normally see them as dharma. How can we get this true dharma eye? That's an important phrase for us, right? True dharma eye. How can we really see the dharma? This is the point of our practice. In the Soto Zen tradition, we do monastic practice to transform our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. The foundation of monastic practice is Zazen, and all the activities in daily monastic life are the manifestation of Zazen practice. Chanting sutras, listening to Dharma talks, eating with Oryoki, cooking, cleaning, even resting and sleeping. Doing all these activities with awakening mind, being mindful and attentive, this is the way we transform our six sense organs into the true dharma, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. So he goes on to say that, of course, most of us in the West don't live in a training temple. <laughs> this is not our daily schedule. This is not you know, the focus for most of us of our daily activities. This is kind of monastic round of practice where we're doing three services a day, you know, we're, we're sitting a couple times a day, we're engaging with the community in a particular way. Um, so he says, you know, we need to find some other way to live with this same kind of spirit. What can we do in our day-to-day -day householding lives to see with this Dharma eye, right? To see things clearly. We have to find other ways uh, to experience this thing that Dogen is describing about seeing clearly and knowing that there is no separation between senses and their objects even though in our day-to-day -day life we're, con we're in contact with something, you know, how do we see that and also see that there is originally no separation there? So of course we can do this through all of the activities of our practice lives and our daily lives, um, zazen work and study. We always have an opportunity to sort of uh, dig into that and see how it works. We don't have to be in a special temple. We don't have to take on some special uh, role or status as practitioners. As long as we're taking in stimulation through the Dharma gates and working with it skillfully, we are engaged in that practice, right? And when it comes to our zazen, of course, our bodies and minds are fully functioning. When we sat, when we sit, you know, we just sat a period of zazen and everything was working. <laughs> we were seeing, we were hearing, we were feeling the touch of our clothes, right? All of those senses were working. Body was fully functioning. Um, you know, we're not turning anything off. We're not suppressing anything that's happening. There are some kinds of sitting practices in various traditions where the point is to really disengage from the senses in order to not be distracted and in order to really focus on whatever the point of that meditation practice is. For us, we're not shutting anything off. We're not turning anything off. It's all coming in. Um, so, you know, that means our senses are working. We're smelling the incense. We're hearing the bell, right? We're feeling our cushions under us as part of our zazen, as part of the content of our zazen. So because we're human, we're taking all those sensations in, we're creating a world. <laughs> Even during zazen, we're taking all of that stuff in, right? And we're creating a world. So Uchiyama Roshi called the appearance of the world as we perceive it through our senses, the scenery of our zazen, right? So we're aware of the scenery. We're aware of what's happening. I know there's you know morning light coming in the window. Uh, you know I know the cat is yowling in the background. All of that's happening, I'm taking all of that in, but I'm not clinging to it, right? We can't rest in that. Um, it's all coming and going, right? Like the clouds in the sky, they say, all of that scenery is coming and going. None of it is fixed, none of it is permanent. Our perception of it isn't complete or permanent either. So what about that are we gonna cling to? And I think in Zazen, we have a real opportunity 
to fully experience that because we're not being distracted by needing to move through the world. We're going to sit down, let go of thought, you know, take the posture, fully engage in Zazen and not make anything out of what's coming in through the sense gates. It comes and it goes. We're aware of it. We're not grasping it, clinging to it, writing a story about it, judging it. I like it. I don't like it. I think it's so easy for us in Zazen to say, well, I need to create some perfect conditions for my Zazen. And especially now that we're all sitting at home, we'd like to be in control of that corner where we sit, right? So we want to set up something where there's minimal distraction and the temperature is right and we feel comfortable there and all of that's good. But we also know if we wait to sit Zazen until the conditions are perfect, we'll never sit. <laughs> there's always going to be something coming in through the sense gate. So yes, we want to make sure we're not sitting in a place where you know there's a street light coming in and hitting you in the eye we can move <laughs> right we can there are things we can do to um, create some good conditions for our zazen but we also know we ought to be able to sit zazen in a bus station because all this stuff is coming in and going uh, we just need to not cling to it rest in it make something out of it so hojo-san did a translation of keizan zenji's zazen yojin ki or called you know in english things we should be careful about in our zazen so in this text, Kazan describes how we let go of everything during Zazen and we drop off body and mind. So he says, Zazen is far beyond the form of sitting or lying down. Free from considerations of good or evil, Zazen transcends distinctions between ordinary people and sages. It goes far beyond judgments of deluded or enlightened. Zazen includes no boundary between sentient beings and Buddha. Therefore, put aside all affairs and let go of all associations do nothing at all. The six senses produce nothing. So after all of that description, he's coming back to something which feels pretty concrete. You know, we're sitting there and stuff is coming into the senses and he's saying, wait a minute, in Zazen, senses produce nothing. So another translation says the six senses are inactive. So they're there because this human body has sense organs, but you know, they're not producing anything. They're inactive. So in other words, we're not fabricating stuff out of what's coming in through the sense gates during our Zazen. We're making no distinctions between one thing and another because we're letting go of thought, right? We're simply letting the universe function through us. The small self kind of steps back, right? And Zazen is doing Zazen. The universe is doing Zazen. We happen to <laughs> be the, the conduit for that, if you will, right? But, you know, we're not poking our heads in. So we're not creating stories about what comes in through the senses. There's another famous image for this, and that is the stone woman and the wooden man. And maybe you've encountered this. These two things come from the Hokkyo Zamai uh, or the Song of the Precious Mirror Samadhi. This is a ninth century Chinese poem by Dongshan Yangjie. This is another one that we chant every other day in Japan. We alternate Sandokai and Hokkyo Zamai every morning. So again, this text is important for us. So the particular line I'm thinking of says, the stone, I'm sorry, the wooden man starts to sing, the stone woman gets up dancing, which is a wonderful poetic kind of description, right? Um, in the context of the poem, these are two insentient beings preaching the Dharma. We have wood and we have stone preaching the Dharma, which feels counterintuitive, right? Um, this poem says that preaching can only be understood by Buddhas. So because the stone woman would be dancing without movement and the wooden man would be singing without sound, these activities can only be understood by Buddhas. So it's also making the point that in the broad view, there is no distinction between sentient and non-sentient beings. These two beings are simply and completely carrying out their function as wood or as stone uh, with nothing extra. They're doing what they do. They're fulfilling completely their Dharma position in this moment with nothing extra. So in that way, they're just like the Bodhisattva that simply carries out Bodhisattva vows, does the Bodhisattva activity with nothing extra, right? Nothing added in. So again, the universe is functioning completely through all of these beings, the stone woman or the jade woman and the wooden man and you and I as bodhisattvas, right? This is just the universe doing what it does. So Dogen, as is his way, picks up this image of the stone woman and the wooden man and gives it a kind of a different context. So um, in Dogen's extensive record, there is a Dharma Hall discourse. In other words, he was giving a bit of a Dharma talk to his people in the Dharma Hall. And he says, for nine years, Bodhidharma bestowed a single utterance. Until now, people in various regions have mistakenly taken it up. 
Do you want to demonstrate it without mistakes? Ehe will again demonstrate it for the sake of all of you. The Iron Ring Mountains surround Mount Sumeru at the center. This is just exactly right. Thus it is demonstrated completely. However, is it possible to demonstrate it unmistakably? After a pause, Dogen said, the Jade Woman recalls her dream of the triple world. The wooden man sits, cutting off functioning of the six senses. Dogen descended from his seat. So that's all he had to say. <laughs> he left his people to puzzle on what that means. So, okay, you know, what does all that mean? For nine years, Bodhidharma bestowed a single utterance. Well, we know that our tradition says that Bodhidharma sat Zazen for nine years in a cave facing the wall. Um, he didn't say anything. He just sat there for nine years doing Zazen, faced the wall, didn't say anything. So Dogen says he communicated only one thing, and that thing is thusness, right? He was simply sitting, nothing extra, doing what he was doing in that moment, Zazen, doing Zazen. So for nine years, he only uttered one thing, and he did it silently, and what he uttered, what he communicated was thusness. Until now, people in various regions have mistakenly taken it up. So he says, no one's really understood what Bodhidharma was doing and what to make of that. What do we make of somebody sitting facing a wall for nine years saying nothing? Well, he wasn't saying nothing. Do you want to demonstrate it without mistakes? Ehe will again demonstrate it for the sake of all of you. So Dogen's gonna show us how it's done. <laughs> so, okay, they've all been wrong up to now. You know, here's how it's done. The Iron Ring Mountains surround Mount Sumeru at the center. This is just exactly right. Thus, it is demonstrated completely. So this is a, a description of mountains in uh, Indian Buddhist cosmology. So this is another way for Dogen to say, this is reality just as it is. Mountains are surrounding mountains. You know, here they are. This is reality just as it is, nothing extra. However, it is, is it possible to demonstrate it unmistakably? After a pause, Dogen said, the Jade Woman recalls her dream of the triple world. The wooden man sits, cutting off functioning of the six senses. Dogen descended from his seat. So the Jade Woman, or the Stone Woman, is right in the midst of thusness, or nirvana, or awakening, and is also right in the middle of this illusory world of samsara. So she recalls her dream of the triple world, right? So she's sitting completely, being a Stone Woman, doing completely that. Nothing extra, thusness and at the same time recalling <laughs> that nirvana and samsara are not different. So here's nirvana, here's thusness, but here is also the world of the senses. Here is also the world of transmigration, and these things are not separate. The wooden man is sitting zazen, also right in the middle of thusness, or right in the middle of awakening, completely alive, completely functioning, and doing exactly what Kazan described later in the zazen yojinki, not fabricating anything out of the sense gates. So um, wooden man sits cutting off functioning of the six senses. In other words, wooden man is sitting there completely doing the activity of this moment, nothing extra, uh, and not fabricating, writing a story out of what comes in through the sense gates. So we live in the world of the senses, and we also go beyond the world of the senses, and that's what this wooden man is doing, right? That's what we are all doing during Zazen. Sense gates are an opportunity to study and investigate the world, and our own moment by moment experience in a very direct kind of juicy way, right? Uh, there are things we really like about what comes in through the sense gates. This, you know, Uchiyama Roshi is always talking about the freshness of this moment, the aliveness of our practice. We certainly don't want to somehow ignore what's coming in through the sense gates because that is part of the freshness and aliveness of our practice. The challenge is not to get caught by our senses, right? Not to lose sight, <laughs> no pun intended, not to lose sight of what we're doing in our practice and in our moment by moment life. So what would you like to say this morning about sense gates, practicing with sense gates, things that come in through the sense gates? What's on your mind this morning? I'm going to turn to gallery view for myself just so that I can see everybody. Let's uh, remove our spotlight. There we go. Uh, gallery view. Okay, now I can see people. <laughs> what would you like to say? I've stunned everyone into silence. You have nothing coming in through your sense gates anymore. I could talk a bit about the uh, original text. Oh, um, please do. Yay. <laughs> Doju's here to give us a kanji lesson. Hold on. Let me see if I can uh, copy it in. Hold on just a sec. This is the best part of the talk, man. <laughs> <laughs>
I have to say. Well, I actually have uh, some exciting news about discoveries regarding this text oh, that, I, yeah. that I've made. Um, so I, I guess that you've probably said it before, but you know, this uh, whole thing is kind of copied and pasted from an older text uh, into Shobogenzo and it wasn't, it probably like Dogen was planning to comment on it, but never got to it because it was one of the last sort of things that he was working on. Um, and I guess I didn't realize that the text that it came from is quite old. Um, yeah. So it's, it's actually, you know, a Sanskrit text probably because it exists both in Tibetan and Chinese. Um, and it's supposed to be um, a work uh, about the Buddha's past lives um, that came from the Dharma Guptaka school, which was one of these pre Mahayana schools of Buddhism. Um, and then there's another text that has the exact same list of 108 Dharma gates, uh, gates of Dharma illumination um, that only survived in Tibetan and Sanskrit, but not in Chinese. Um, and I just found an English translation of that text. So it has kind of alternative renderings from Tibetan and Sanskrit. Oh, yay. Um, I hope you'll send these. me that. <laughs> yes, I will. Yeah. So thank you. That's terrific. Um, so yeah, for this one in the Chinese, the, the thing that, so the translation from Nishijima, I think is, it's kind of uh, wrong um, a little bit. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> uh, because the, so the, the first two characters, it means many entrances. So you mentioned that this, you know, character is literally entrance, um, which is a translation of the Sanskrit word ayatana, which also means entrance. Um, but it refers not to the sense organs, but actually to both the sense organs and their objects and the contact between them. Um, so, you know, Nishijima just says sense organs, which is kind of inaccurate. But, you know, I, I think that the way that you talked about it, Hoko kind of covers all of that anyways. Um, and then there's just sort of one interesting uh, kind of ambiguity. So in the, um, so it says many entrances are uh, Dharma illumination gate. Uh, and then it says kind of practicing correct way, therefore is basically literally what it says. But um, the correct way, um, so this is the same two characters that are used in the Eightfold Noble Path. So if you added an eight in front of that, it would be the term for Eightfold Noble Path. Oh, how interesting. Um, but also it can mean a true awakening. Um, so you could, and, and I, I guess if Dogen was going to kind of rework this, that might be one of the ways that he would mess with it and say, you know, if you uh, have a understanding of the um, sense organs and their objects, then it will allow you to practice true awakening. Um, I don't think that that's what it was intended um, in the original version, but you could read it that way. But I'm sure you're right. That's what he would have said because he, because of this whole teaching of his about um, all of these things are instances of prajna, which would not be separate from awakening. So I'm sure you're absolutely right. And then just finally, the, so the translation from the Tibetan that I found um, for this one, it's, it's kind of different actually, which is interesting, but um, it says withdrawal of the senses is a gateway to the light of the Dharma for it leads one to meditate on the path. Ah, uh, um, that so feels it, really early Buddhist, doesn't it? Mm -hmm, yeah, but it has some yeah distinct differences, but still. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting because, uh, you know, as I mentioned, you know, there are early streams, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there are early streams of Buddhism where sitting practice was very much about sort of detachment from the world in order to disenchant ourselves with the seduction that comes with all of that kind of clinging and sensory stuff, right? So, yeah, yeah. so that feels like really early. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the withdrawal is usually referring to the shamatha. So mm. there's like two divisions of yep. meditation, shamatha and uh, vipassana, awesome. which right. you know usually is vipassana now. Right. Um, right. And shamatha is yeah, like sort of shutting down the senses. Yeah, and I, if I remember correctly, that was kind of seen as a linear thing, right? I mean, you withdrew and calmed and did things in order to, right? Do the sort of insight. <laughs> Uh, kinds of practices. And, yeah, yeah, I mean, there, you know, there were interesting sort of like debates between uh, proponents of one or the other, and sometimes right. they're kind of fused together. But it's also where the, you know, the word dhyana 
uh, comes from Zen. So in, in shamatha practice, there are four stages of mm -hmm. dhyana, depending on how much stuff you're shutting down. So the highest dhyana is like, you know, when you have kind of no awareness, basically, of the outside world anymore. Right, right. So, I mean, we can really see how practice with sense gates has shifted. You know, it's not just so I, I'm always careful when I'm speaking to, to this group to position whatever it is, you know, within our particular Dharma family. But it's useful to know, as, as Doju says, these texts are really old. Um, you know, they can be interpreted in more than one way. So I'm careful to interpret it within <laughs> the way maybe our, you know, our teachers would practice with it. But, you know, it's uh, the whole the, the whole picture is broader than that. Right. So that's really interesting, Doju. Thank you for all of that background. See, this is, I love the partnership. <laughs> Are there other things uh, either from Doju or others today? Well, <clears throat> just continue on the semi-academic uh, angle. Um, the, um, the perspective that you carefully put together today, Hoka, which was, was really fun for me, um, mirrors with remarkable fidelity. Um, some reading I've been doing in this sort of, um, in this kind of the neuroscience of um, the chemical senses with, with taste and smell. And uh, it's culminated sort of recently, this is all in the last 10 years or so in the field with a book called Neurogastronomy. Ooh. And and it was almost word for word, some of the uh, things that you were citing from, I think from Ujima Roshi, um, about the, this recent brand new research on how the sound of chewing can change the flavor of your food and how the colors of wine changes your perception of the, of the taste. And it goes on and on through the, the, the science of this, but right down to the, the swallowing and the settling in the stomach, it was, it was uh, almost creepy. <laughs> it, but it was wonderful. Yeah, ah, really our, our teachers are way ahead of us. <laughs> Ah, interesting. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, interesting. Oh, interesting. Um, well, I guess it just goes to show that these things are, I mean, here's the human experience, right? You know, these are these are commonalities we can all sort of identify with, you know? Well, I think, the, I think honestly, the, the, among some people, I think that, that this work has been getting attention for the same reason as that it's a, a really sensitive sharing of, of human experience and, and going from the, these the little almost silly experiments into a, a really rich discussion of, of the, the way we construct, actively construct our experiences. Absolutely. Well, I mean, we certainly know that um, how we feel about whatever it is we're eating makes a difference, right? Somebody I love made this for me, therefore, <laughs> no matter what it tastes like, it's really good. Or, um, you know, I was really depressed when I ate such and so, and it didn't have any flavor, right? I mean, there's just all of these things are interacting. So, um, it's, it's useful, I think, to, as we help to, as we try to see through the illusion, you know, to just see how we're pulled around, how our experience of something changes because all of these elements are interacting. Interesting. What would others like to say this morning? Hoko, there was a, there was a moment when you were talking, when you, um, I guess we're talking about in Zazen, all of the all of the coming and going of, of sense experience through all the gates and it's all happening. And, um, and you said, I think what you said is you can't, you can't rest. We can't rest in because everything is constantly in flux and changing and um, there's nothing to rest upon. Um, But I wonder if it is possible to rest. That feels, yeah, that feels counterintuitive, doesn't it? And mm -hmm. even when I used the word, I thought I'm going to trip, trip somebody up with this. Mm -hmm. It isn't so much that we can't settle. It's that we can't rest on something. So, you know, take that word out and just say there's nothing we can cling to. There's nothing we can stand on. Um, you know, we would like to say, well, I've created my world and therefore mm -hmm. Um, I don't need to see it any more clearly than that. I can just assume that what I 
am experiencing is the totality of this thing. Phew. And actually, <laughs> our teachers are saying, well, we have to see through that illusion, right? So um, rest is a problematic word, and I probably shouldn't have used it because, you know, it isn't so much that we can't settle. It's that we can't settle down on our particular um, perception and say, whew, there, I've planted my flag, you know, I'm solid, nothing will ever move. Um, so, you know, the, ironically, the way we settle is by letting go of that. Because as soon as we rest on something, the ground shifts under it and, you know, we're thrown over again, right? So there is resting, but there's no resting on. Let's think about it that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for calling me on it because I knew it was a problem as soon as it came out of my mouth. <laughs> words, we have to be very careful about words. <laughs> Other comments this morning? Questions? Maybe just to kind of connect to that, I can uh, think of uh, how many times at the end of Sashin, Hojisan says, it was really peaceful. Mm -hmm. So there's your rest. Yeah, exactly. Well, actually, I think for him, when he says that, he's comparing it to Genzoi, <laughs> where he's giving, you know, myriad talks on a day, and there's a lot of activity and a lot of hubbub, and I think he appreciates Sashin because it's just, we sit silently, you know, 14 periods a day. Um, but yeah, I think when we've when we've done Sashin and it's really gone smoothly and it's felt very solid and settled, there is something peaceful about that. One of the things I've learned, and I've learned it the hard way, unfortunately at the expense of Sashin participants, is that I don't just randomly sort of ask everybody to ring the Zazen bell. I used to do that. Um, thinking everybody can participate, everyone can look at a clock and ring a bell. And the problem was everyone was so nervous. Oh my gosh, how many, you know, and they would start three days before their volunteer, their dough on slot. How many times do I ring the bell? And when do I ring it? And what do I do? And do I light the candle? And then do I sit down? And, and you could just feel the room was like this for the entire session. And I thought, I'm actually not doing anybody any favors. And so the next session, I just said, I'm going to ring the bell. And I did. And unsolicited, after the session, people were saying, oh, that was so peaceful. <laughs> uh, okay, so, you know, this anxiety is unsettling for people. We need to just let people, you know, kind of let go of. Because this is part of, you know, if the mind is one of our senses and the mind object is, I'm nervous what I do about this bell, you know, this is just going off all the time and it's not allowing anybody to drop body and mind. So the way I was, you know, the way I had to let people drop body and mind was to ring the bell. So anyway, yeah, that <laughs> we, I think we can, uh, I, I think we have some sense of when things have settled, when things have landed, right? <laughs> so I'm learning along with everybody else. My apologies for those I made ring a bell and made them nervous. <laughs> Other things to say this morning? Kata, please. Um, Hoko, thank you very much for uh, the talk. It's, uh, it's quite inspiring. And I want to kind of share something that resonated very well with me, this idea of um, <clears throat> our practice, formal Zazen or informal practice as, as a conduit for everything else functioning. I find that it's such an inspiring way of framing the practice that although it's rooted in a scenery of our lives, is not necessarily done by this kind of a small I, small me. And it helps me, at least intellectually, kind of a, a massage a little bit and loosen up this idea of me and ego and incorporate a little bit of movement back and forth with uh, the universe, the world, whatever whatever sense, whatever word you want to use. But it's, a, it's, a, it's a way that kind of makes it a little bit more reciprocal rather than I'm doing something. Yeah, well, yeah. I can't remember who I quoted the other week that, you know, the quote was Zazen is not done by an individual. Zazen yeah. is not the pra a practice done by the individual. So I think if we can really feel that, I, I think perhaps where we can feel that is Zazen because we're dropping off body and mind. Um, but of course, it's true of all of our, all of our other activities as well. Um, for me, it really f helps me to feel that connection with the universe, to really drop sort of the whole, I am an individual and, you know, have a separate, you know, completely separate existence. It really, it really helps to, I think, put us in touch with the emptiness of that and, and, and really feel the emptiness of, you know, five skandhas. Mm -hmm. If we think, well, you know, if the universe is functioning, 
um, kind of through me or with me. <laughs> it's not only little me. Um, yeah, I, fi I also find that very helpful. So I'm glad it was useful for you. Thank you. Yes. Other comments this morning? Reflections, questions? Okay. So let's do our closing chant. Um, and then Hoshin, I think what I'll, I think I'll ask you to do announcements while I light charcoal up here before our world peace ceremony. I'll, I'll have a little shifting around and stuff to set up myself, but uh, okay. I'll find a point in order to do the uh, uh, announcements. Okay. So. Okay. Very good. Thanks for a dis good. Yeah, thanks for a good discussion this morning, folks. We will do our world peace ceremony following our chant.